All right, well, I'll go ahead and get started with some of the introductions for this webinar. My name is Jillian Noonan. I'm with the Geotechnical Center of Excellence at the University of Arizona. And this is our first webinar of a series of five webinars that will be focusing on mining hydrogeology topics. And we will have panels discussing uh, your questions during each of these webinars. Um, we're gonna be running uh, approximately about one per month. Um, and this is the first one. Our topic it, today is on site characterization and planning of mine hydrology programs. Ask the experts. And we have a panel of experts here today that are ready and willing to answer your questions. Um, I will introduce them in more detail in just a moment. But first, uh, just a little bit about the Geotechnical Center of Excellence. Uh, so we are industry funded and member led center. We are an interdisciplinary center that works across um, academia and through industry to develop collaborative geotechnical research and education. And our main goal is to bridge gaps that exist within and between academia, industry, and fields of study. And we do this with our research projects and also by offering courses um, such as the Water and Mine Operations and Slope Stability course, which many of our panelists today are also presenters in that course. If you're interested to learn more about the GCE, you can visit our website, follow us on LinkedIn, email us at the email shown here. And the course that I mentioned is currently running and available for registration. It is 30 hours of online professional development titled Water and Mine Operations and Slope Stability, all available online. Um, if you're interested in more about that course, you can scan the QR code here or Benjamin will be putting in um, a link in the chat that you can click on to learn more. And the course that I just mentioned was developed in partnership with Pateau Associates and also with the large open pit project. So I'd like to acknowledge them. And then I'd also like to acknowledge all of the GCE member companies uh, without their support. Also, and you would not be able to run webinars such as this or do all of the great research um, and uh, course development that the GCE does. So thank you so much to our member companies. And now to introduce the team here today, um, for the GCE side, the webinar team today consists of myself. As I mentioned, I'm Jillian Noonan, Senior R&D Engineer with the GCE. And then along with me today, helping out to field your questions and uh, run the webinar are Benjamin Meyer. And Benjamin is a software engineer here at the GCE who usually works on the thermal imaging research project, but today is helping out with our webinar. So Benjamin, appreciate your help today. Thanks. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us. And then also here today from the GCE is Christian Ortman. Um, Christian is a computing sciences researcher for the GCE, and today we'll be also helping out with our webinar. Thank you so much, Christian. Appreciate it. Thank you, Jillian. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar. And now it's my pleasure to introduce the expert panel here today. Um, first, we, firstly, we have Jeff Beal, um, who is the Global Technical Advisor with Pateau Associates. I'm not sure if Jeff's able to say hi to uh, right now because uh, he had to mute for a moment. Jeff, are you there? All right, we'll pass on from him, but he will be back. Um, and then we have Simon Scholl, who is going to be joining us in about 30 minutes or so, coming from another meeting. Um, Simon, when you see him, you'll know him as Principal Hydrogeologist, also with Pateau Associates. And then here now uh, is Travis White. Travis is joining us from Anglo-American, and Travis is Principal Hydrogeologist. Thank you so much, Travis. So glad to have you here today. Thanks very much, Jill, and uh, welcome, everyone. And we have Gus Rowland. Gus is the Country Manager for South Africa and Principal Hydrogeologist for Pateau Associates. Hello, Gus. Thanks for having me. Hello, everyone. And also joining us on the expert panel today is Jim Weigel. Jim is Principal Hydrogeologist with Rio Tinto Kennecott Copper at the Bingham Canyon Mine. Jim, great to have you here today. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to all the questions. Yes. All right. And speaking of questions, good lead in, Jim. Um, now I'll just run through for our participants today, how do you participate in this interactive webinar? 
So what we have for you today is an expert panel. They are here to answer your questions. The way you will ask those questions is through the Zoom functions um, and primarily the Q&A. So if you look on your control panel, you'll see a button that looks like this. It says Q&A. If you click on that button, it should open a window where you'll be able to type in questions into that window. You're also able to view others' questions in that window. And if you see a question that you like, you can click a thumbs up and upvote the question. And we will pull questions that are higher rated. So if you see a question that pertains to something you'd like to know as well, make sure you upvote it. And um, Benjamin and Christian will be sorting through those questions and we'll be pulling those live for our panel to answer. We'll also be going through um, some pre-submitted questions that came in from either participants of the water course or through um, the form that was posted on LinkedIn. Questions today can be anonymous. You can just click a button to submit it anonymously. And as always, we are recording the webinar, so it will be available later on the GC's YouTube as well as on the course site. All right. And if our panel is ready, we'll get started with our first question. Let me go ahead and pull that up. All right, so what I'll do for our panel today is I will read out each question and then I will open it up to the panel to go ahead and um, comment and, and make any um, conversation starting that you would like. I do see one of our participants is raising their hand and I just wanna let you know, we will not be able to unmute anyone that is on the participant side of the webinar today just due to we would need to have you sign a release because we are recording the webinar. So everything will go through the chat and through the Q&A. All right, so our first question that I will pose to the panel is on the topic of today, which is planning a mine hydrology program. I'll also add into that um, site characterization that goes into planning a program. Um, so we'll be asking the panel, what are some of the most common pitfalls or challenges that you have encountered that those planning a mine hydrology program should be aware of? We'll get started with this question. Uh, maybe I'll call on Gus. Would you like to start? Yeah, happy to. This is a, a bit of a pet of mine. And um, off the top of my head, there's, there's three real areas that I feel are common pitfalls. Um, the first one being neglecting the significant amount of information that tends to be available on mine sites. Uh, the second one is trying to collect two months too much information or feeling that you always need more information before you can start making decisions. And the third one is not integrating with other technical teams on mine sites. There's an enormous amount of information to be gathered from the geotechnical, geological, mining engineering, and um, process engineering sides of the various mining teams. Um, and there's a huge amount of value in, in getting integration between those various teams um, so that you get an idea of what's available. So the first one of those is, is neglecting the information that's already on the site. I think quite often there's a, a, a bit of a knee-jerk reaction, especially from consultants to uh, initiate drilling campaigns and initiate instrumentation campaigns and, and start putting in um, extra things without actually properly interrogating the site and understanding what the site already has available and what the people on the site already have available. And so making sure that that is the kind of the first port of call is speaking to people on site and finding out what they know and what they don't know, really getting a gap analysis done first. Um, the second one is trying to do too much all at once. Um, you can get a lot of traction by doing the simple things first, making sure you have decent weather data, making sure you have decent rainfall data, um, confirming if the site already has a groundwater monitoring program or a pore pressure monitoring program. Um, that will often allow you to focus your investigation exactly where it needs to be instead of trying to do too much all at once. And then the third one is taking advantage of any other work that's being done on site, especially drilling. At the end of the day, the mining company, if they're drilling, are paying for holes in the ground. And we need to make sure that you maximize the amount of information coming out of that single hole as far as possible. 
And that's best done by coordinating anybody and everybody who needs information out of a hole as early as possible in the process so that you don't try and hijack a program late in the day to install instrumentation or gather geotechnical information that wasn't originally planned. Make sure that planning starts as early as possible and includes as many technical people as possible to ensure that you get the maximum value out of the hole you've just paid for. That's a pretty good summary, Gus. Um, anything to add? I see Travis, you have your hand up. Go right ahead. Yeah, th thanks, Jill, and thanks, Gus. <clears throat> you know, just to reiterate um, the, the first point that Gus mentioned, um, one of the big issues is, um, you know, we need to appreciate that hydrogeology is, is a relatively underappreciated uh, discipline globally. It's usually something that comes in as a result of a problem or a challenge or a slope failure or some kind of issue and then gets brought in um, after the fact. Um, it is changing slowly, but, uh, but definitely not quick enough. And um, one of the big issues or pitfalls is, is the, the baseline characterization is, is off. There's often a huge gap there, right? So any mine starts out as a drilling project somewhere or a brownfield drilling project, and there's information there that's available that doesn't get uh, used or exploited. So piggybacking on, on what Gus mentioned, the holes are being drilled, and at least in the Southern Hemisphere, at least some of these holes cost uh, the same as a house. So if you're spending a house on a hole, or the, the equivalent of a house on a hole, the least you can do is collect some 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 information, some data. Um, so that's the first thing. And then um, just on the challenges, you know, leveraging off the fact that, uh, you know, hydrogeology is an underappreciated uh, discipline is you need to do a good job at selling why you need to do the work. All right. So as part of the large open pit project, we look at, you know, uh, business cases, look at NPVs for, for dewatering, depressurization. And uh, Jeff, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think we've come across a case where dewatering in advance or, or implementing a depressurization program has a negative MPV. Right? There's always value in protecting the biggest asset at a mine, which is the mine itself. Right? The mine is the biggest piece of infrastructure that will ever be constructed at any mining project, bigger than the tailings dam, bigger than any waste rock dump, definitely bigger than any plant that gets built. So yeah, selling um, the, the value that can be unlocked through, through doing uh, the basics and the fundamentals early and getting that baseline correct are, are important. And Jeff dropped off for a minute and just came back. So I'm not sure if he heard that or if he's back to be able to unmute. I think he's still wrapped up. If you can hear us, Jeff, whenever you're ready, turn your camera on so we'll know if you're there. And then um, we'll just keep going in the meantime. Jim, would you like to go ahead? Sure. Yeah, no, I mean... Gus pretty much summed it up really well. And so Travis, uh, one of the things I just want to really hit home is you just have to be integrated. I mean, they've hit home on that, but you also also be really integrated with the mine planning teams. Uh, Cause a lot of the infrastructure in a currently operational mind is, you know, has to be replaced or you're having to put in new infrastructure or you might have a new problem that crops up that requires some, you know, vertical wells. In order to put the vertical wells in, you have to have a design that allows you to maintain those pieces of infrastructure. The same goes to some extent for piezometers. If they end up five benches up from, from an access point, is anyone going to be able to get back down to that piece of infrastructure? So a lot of pre-planning and understanding of where you're going to have access and planning for that access is extremely important, especially in older operations as you continue to develop the, the ore body. And then just, oh, I could... as, sorry, I just as a side, we, we do piggyback a lot on our um, geology holes. They'll go in as core. We might not have decided, we not, as part of our hydro program, we might not have a piece zone necessarily installed there, but if the hole's available, I mean, putting in some VWPs and then grouting it up isn't that much of an extra cost. So we we greatly capitalize on coordinating and getting these kind of one-offs when we weren't necessarily planning on doing it. Small extra expense for a lot of overall benefit. Uh, yeah, Jim, I mean, that that is, that is totally true. I mean, the most important thing on a, to get 
of any investigation is the water level in as many holes as you can and as many pisos as you can. And I think I said in the course, the first thing I always do when I go to a mine site is look at all the water level data. And you've got to think that if the groundwater heads are very different or they follow topography or they're not consistent, you're not going to have a whole lot of flow. If you've got very discontinuous heads, it's telling you you've got a low flow system. If you've got very continuous heads, if all your water levels are similar and you've got a flat water table, it's telling you you've got an interconnected system. So the first thing to look at is the heads. The second thing is then marry those heads and your observation with the heads with the structural model. And then oftentimes you'll see it jump out that you get uh, changes in heads or discontinuous heads uh, across structures or continuous heads where you've got uh, more permeable units such as uh, carbonates. But if you then piece the heads together with the, with the geology, you're starting to get a good interpretation of the system. And for those of you that know me, you, you know what I'm going to say next. The bane of my life and many people's lives is packer tests. Uh, packer tests measure the permeability of the formation immediately around the borehole. They tell you nothing about how the permeability is interconnected over a wider scale. They tell you nothing about the groundwater flow system. They are most useful when you have a very low permeable permeability unit that you're trying to characterize. Or if, for instance, you're trying to do a characterization of a shaft and you need local information around the shaft. But a really common uh, source of errors in conceptual and groundwater models is applying packer test data and, and calculated permeability numbers from packer tests on a wider scale. And I think that's one of the, the biggest sources of error and the biggest sources of um, of wrong interpretation that I see is, is, is too much use of packer tests. Good. And I do think we knew you might say that if you've watched yeah. the course. I was... <laughs> I spent too many years looking at packer test interpretations and seeing wrong conceptual models developed. That's the beauty of experience, isn't it? It absolutely is. But, you know, um, at a very early, very early part of my career, I learned to look, look at groundwater heads and to um, integrate the heads with the geology and particularly the structural geology because that's telling you the overall flow system it's telling you the wider scale it's giving you the wider scale pictures packer tests will only give you the permeability immediately around the hole which is seldom representative mm -hmm. It's probably uh, worth adding there that the water levels and pore pressures are the cheapest to get. Right? If you're already doing geological and geotech drilling, that drilling tends to be a lot cheaper than large diameter hydrogeological characterization wells or wells that are big enough to put pumps in. And so starting off looking at the water levels um, is your easiest entry point to starting that whole process. Yeah, I think one of the things we're starting to do now with more and more site investigations is take a string of VWPs and do a reverse circulation hole next to, so if it's low, lower permeability, it could be 10 meters. If it's higher permeability, it could be further away. But do a an RC hole close to a, um, a string of VWPs and either airlift it or injection, inject it and induce a response in the VWPs because then that starts to tell you cross-hole information. So it's telling you about the formation on a wider scale between the two drill holes. So that's something we're really trying to push uh, in in site yeah. investigations um, and trying to get that as, as accepted as a, a kind of global procedure. 
Yeah, actually, and that reminds me, Jeff, that's a good point. We're doing this on a couple of deep um, exploration drilling programs in some high flow systems in Zambia, where we're able to see the influence of the drilling fluid on adjacent BWPs. And so the actual process of drilling with diamond and, and uh, injecting fluid into the ground, they, they get a lot of fluid loss, is kind of running a pump test. And it's important not to miss out on some of those inadvertent opportunities for characterization that you mightn't otherwise get because it's not a planned test, but making sure that you're aware of what's going on site uh, and looking at your data with a, with an open mind can give you some of those kind of um, serendipitous characterization opportunities. Go ahead, Travis. Yeah, um, might be a bit specific, but um, one of the really ironic and at the same time annoying things that happens pretty commonly is the first hole that's usually drilled on a, on a greenfield site is a, is a water supply bore, right? And that normally gets a pump in of some sort to supply the drill rigs. And um, that inf information never makes its way through into, into the study report. You know, you normally come in after the drilling campaign to now do separate testing um, and whatever else. And yeah, fortunately, this happens uh, more often than not. So the earlier you're involved in the planning of the drilling program, whatever, whatever stage a project is, um, if there is a water supply bore on the site or near the site, get some monitoring holes in nearby, use the, the information from the pump, from the abstraction from that well. Um, it might not always be ideal, but, but some stress is better than no stress and some information is better than no information. So um, you'll be surprised, you know, the information you can get hold of um, if you're involved and consulted early. So all, um, all hydro geos, make sure any projects, at least be aware, at least be consulted. There's always some information you can gather. Thank you very much for all of your input on this question. I think uh, I'll call for just any final comments here before we move on to some more uh, questions. We have now seven live questions and a number of pre-submitted. So we'll, um, Jim, I think maybe one more thing to add there. Yeah, we've spent a lot of time on groundwater and while it's my where my heart truly lies, we also have to also consider and plan for surface water. Um, cause that can really bite you in the rear, depending on where you're at in the world, the amount of water you get and how it comes into your pit. You have to have a way to manage that surface water and mitigate those precipitation events to reduce, uh, mining downtime. Um, it's also one of the harder ones to do cause you're constantly working within the mine operations groups and teams to leverage the large equipment, to try and maintain those pieces of infrastructure that are constantly getting clogged up with mud. I like to tell people we don't really have water on site. We just make a lot of mud. And the mud has a consistency usually of, of um, concrete. So it's really hard to move around. Oftentimes we load it out, but we do get some overland flow, especially with really large precipitation events, thunder showers, and also during our spring melt. So something not to forget about, just keep that in the back of your mind. Absolutely. Oh. Jeff, there you are. I see you now. Hello. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about the Oh no problem. IT. Sorry about the IT trouble. So I think I'm sorted now. No worries. Um, just a comment before we move on to the next question on the topic of packers that came in um in the chat to me. Um, just that someone has stated that in South Africa and Zambia, they often use packers to isolate fracture zones and perform pump tests within a packed off zone and observe the influence on surrounding BWPs. Yeah, that's, that, that's a, that's a smart use of packers. Uh, if you can isolate a zone and pump it, but it's, you're, you're creating cross hole stress by isolating the zone. And that's the important thing. Good. So that's a that's a very good use of packers. And thanks for that comment. All right, so we talked a bit about challenges in planning a mine hydrology program and characterizing the site. Um, I know Jim mentioned having a lot of data and choosing the data, but now this next question is concerning not having enough data. Um, so this question came in from Tim, who is um, in the water course. So this is submitted through that course site. Um, hi all, I'm enjoying the materials. I have a question. 
if pore pressure or water water level data is limited, what sort of other monitoring or information can be used to understand if pore pressure is affecting a slope or presenting a risk? Would anyone like to start with that? Yeah. Um, so so yeah. So I think um, I think as Jim has just alluded to, um, surface water and rainfall is a big factor for slope stability in, in many climates and, and, and often in dry climates. And some research that's just been done by a group of guys, Warren Warren Newcomen and Laura, Lauren Wagner and a few others have, have actually highlighted that probably more than 50% of all global slope instabilities are related to surface water. So that's one thing you can do is to look at the surface water if you're in that, that type of a climate and see if you can correlate surface water rainfall events with geotechnical information with movement on the radar, movement on prisms. That's always a useful thing to do. It's a useful thing to do anyway, but particularly if your data is limited. So really there's there's no shortage of, there's no substitute for drilling holes and putting in piezometers and putting in um drains or or whatever whatever um system you're going to choose um but you know there's, there's there's people use uh geophysics for instance well geophysics will give you a an idea of where the water table may be it'll give you an idea of what may be saturated but it doesn't really give you any um data that you can really hang your hat on it'll it'll give you background data um it, it becomes more useful if you can calibrate it to uh downhole information but then of course if you can do downhole information you can you can put in piezometer piezometers um so so really the the answer to the question is um if you don't have piezometers uh you're 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 basically struggling you can all look obviously look at seepage into the pit walls but I was just looking at a case in Western Australia uh, earlier today where they had a um, fairly big seep in, in one of the high walls in Nyan Orpit, but impossible to, to, we, we looked at, we looked at the geology, we looked at the structures and, you know, we think the seep is related to discrete flow along the structure from, from a tailings impairment not far away, but it's impossible to characterize it and impossible to get data to put into a, a geotechnical analysis without putting in holes. So the first thing I said to do is drill some holes and put in some piece of this. So yeah, there's there's geophysics, there's seeps, there's observations in the pit, there's rainfall, there's correlation to uh, geotechnical monitoring, but really um, you, you, your bread and butter is piece of this. Any additional comments? I do have some follow-up questions on piezometers that are coming in through the live feed. Yeah, Jill, just, um, sorry, I was actually gonna mention the uh, seepage mapping uh, in the pits. Um, mm -hmm. look, ma mapping in general is, uh, <laughs> is, is, is not done uh, to the same level it was done 10 years ago, but uh, technologies come to the rescue. So you can use um, uh, drones and thermal imagery um, now, so there's some pretty useful uh, and fairly inexpensive tools, and it's done in literally a matter of minutes. So you can do your drone surveys over your pits. You can get a seepage map, you know, the same day, um, and then you know plan your your drilling based on that. But yeah, I agree with with Jeff. Drilling is uh, is king. Without without the drilling and characterization, you're not really going to be uh, adequately addressing the risk, at least. Yeah, and it goes back to what Gus says earlier. You know, I I used to. You're a, a, a two-day course to exploration geologists, just how to collect data from mineral exploration programs. Because you, you, you know, any any mine or virtually any mine that you develop has had a bunch of holes filled um, to to define the ore body and define the geology, if nothing else. So, if you haven't got any instrumentation, it means you've got a lost opportunity. So that's something you know you should talk to your management about and fix as soon as you can. I mean, the, the any piezometer installation, the big big part, the biggest part of the cost by a long way is drilling the hole. So uh, as 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 Gus and I think Travis said, capitalize on what holes you've got and, and, and get them instrumented. 
something to add, Jim? Yeah, I was just going to say another way to help sell putting in the piezometer infrastructure is also to let them know that for small price, they could have, you know, an extra dollar a foot, you can run in a TDR cable. And if you have both of those, then if there is some sort of movement, then you can isolate and see where that, that movement is occurring in the slope. So it can be twofold. We've also had pretty good luck at using our piezometers. They're not as accurate, but we can run a, a time domain reflectometry down the piezometer wires and get locations for where they start to break as well. So even without the, the TDR coaxial cable, you can use the piezometers for multiple things, but it might help you sell the idea of putting in the piezometers. If you say, hey, they're also for geotechnical purposes as well. We can see if there's a, you know, a shear zone that starts to develop in the future. Yeah, that's a good point. And, you know, I can, I can vouch for the fact that Jim is a, a master at correlating slope movement, piezometer, piezometer pressures and downhole TDR shears and downhole and kilometer shears. Um, he's got some great data and he's made some great correlations over the years. So he's he's um, he's definitely uh, onto something when he, when when he says put in TDRs in the same holes as piezometers. Maybe we'll get a case study out of him. He already <laughs> did. <laughs> All right, so um, on the topic of piezometers, we have some questions coming in just um, on using piezometers for site characterization that I think we can just hit on pretty quickly. Um, there's two that I'll grab and we'll do them in succession. So one is asking about quantity. Uh, is there a certain quantity criterion for piezometers or is it enough to put just in critical sections in an open pit mine? And then um, the other question that we'll hit on after that is just um, if you have low density data at your site, how do you distinguish between quality VWP data versus poorly coupled cemented um, VWP that's gonna give you poor quality data? So those are the two questions we'll do right now. Let me go back to the first one um, and have you guys address the quantity criterion. Any tips on that? Um, I can go at that if you want. Uh, so, um, so if you if you're limited, um, you sh sure sure you sh you should focus on your critical sections. And you know if the if the geotechs have, have flagged certain sectors or, or or certain parts of the pit or 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 certain uh, elevations or certain units. Um, focus on those and you know a big a, a big another issue that we're we're trying to push is is try to understand your geotechnical failure mechanisms and your zones of deformation initially from the geotechnical model and make sure your piezometers are actually focused on those areas close to the pit wall if you've got a failure surface that's let's say 50 60 70 meters behind the pit wall that's where you want but your piezometer. A lot of times there's not much benefit putting a piezometer 300 meters behind the slope if your critical surface is 80 meters behind the slope. So definitely focus on the critical sections and um, focus the instruments close to the zones of predicted instability. And then just gradually build up the picture, start with the critical sections and then gradually add instruments as, as and when as and when you can, if geology is drilling holes or if geotech is drilling holes, add instruments as you can. So there's no, there's no, there's no fixed number. The more, the better. The same as anything else, of course. Um, but you know, I think I'll put in some guideline numbers for you know, certainly in the water book. I can't remember whether I did them in the course or not. But you know, um, a, a decent sized pit should should have at least kind of thirty holes with BWPs in them if and it depends on the on the you know on the geotechnical risk if you've got strong rock and you never get any instability then you don't need as many but if you've got weak rocks or lots of instability then you need more so you know a big pit a big you know big porphyry copper pit will typically have at least 30 holes with piezometers in 
That's a small pit, Jeff. Well, yeah, we're running. You. We're running three hundred and thirty-five collars with over seventeen hundred VWPs. I could, bitch at you. I could bitch at you if you want, Jim, but no, probably no, better not to do that here. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, Jeff's on. Just there's some key points. Like, figure out if you're if you're a greenfield site, figure out where the critical rock masses are. Look for like contrasts in rock quality. So when it, you know, the QSI or GSI, sorry, changes or RQD changes, uh, put it in the lower quality rocks if you can. And then also in and around structures or big lithologic changes, like especially if you're going from sediments to intrusives, those are usually good places to have VWPs um, at those transitions in rock mass types or along major structures. Uh, those are, and invariably there'll be other locations outside of the critical zones. The geotech is initially identified, but those are ones you have to follow up because invariably they'll start seeing some sort of surface movement and they'll mob a rig in to drill in to get some core to investigate. And then that's where you have to just be kind of on the spot with some VWPs ready. So. If you can, always have a little stockpile of VWPs. So when those borehole opportunities come up, you're not waiting around to get them shipped out to site. So you can just go, you know, before they, the rig comes off, say, and before they go and abandon it, say, hey, I'd like to put these down and we'd like to grout them up. Here's our grout mixture. You're going to abandon them in any house. So let's put some instrumentation in the hole. So that's kind of another approach too. Yeah, the opportunistic installations are very, very valuable. Yeah, and I think um, just to add there as well, sorry, Jillian, is it, don't treat VWPs as some laugh of mind piece of infrastructure. Um, they're going to get mined out, that you're going to lose some, sometimes the slope's going to fail, you know, your pit's going to push back. They shouldn't be treated as if they're going to last forever. Um, they're definitely consumable in some stages, and they sh you shouldn't put your VWP so far away from the pit that they're not useful, as Jeff mentioned earlier. Um, quite often there's this tendency to save money by not um, destroying or losing the VWPs, but you're also losing all of the information that that VWP would have given you before it gets destroyed or mined out or, or lost. And what you're really paying for with a VWP is information. It's not the sensor, it's not the cable, it's not the telemetry, you're paying for information. And if you divide the cost of the VWP by how long it runs for, you find out that the data is actually cheaper and cheaper, um, the more important it is, right? Not necessarily how, uh, how long it lasts for in terms of the consequences of that information and how it can feed into your geotechnical decisions and your slope design and those sorts of things. The value is in the data, not in the sensor itself. And just real quickly, I think you just segued really well into a question before we go to the one on quality of data on um, this was marked as Travis, you marked that this was one that you thought was a good question. Um, Augustus is just talking about mining out VWP. So let's just hit on this one real quick as well. Um, so the course mentioned mining through and recovering VWPs. So any experience with this, maybe we'll just chat a little bit more about that and then get back into um, quality of data. So, so Travis, did you want to start with this one? Yeah, sure. So th this is a good question. Um, look, I must admit, I've only done this once. So we had a, a deep uh, multi-level um, VWP installation, seven VWPs in a in a 10-inch hole down to 400 meters. And we successfully managed to recover <clears throat> cables twice. So we took two, uh, basically minor two levels. Um, what we did, though, was we didn't fully, uh, fully grout the hole. So we, we grouted all the VWPs in place, but we left sort of the upper... Uh, 50 meters of the cable uh, suspended. Um, there was sufficient enough grout in, and then we didn't have any any stress on the cable. And what we did is we we filled the basically the the, the empty part of the casing with um, this expanding foam, and then when we drilled uh, the blast, the production block, um, we drilled what's called pre-splits. Pretty sure that's that's common practice um, in in open pit mining now. And the pre-split protected the bore, and then um, when the, when the mining team came to load out, cut the casing, uh, we treated it as a special area. So not uh, you don't have a 40 
4800 or 4100 uh, PH shovel in there. You've got ideally a hydraulic shovel. And yeah, we successfully recovered um, the piezo twice and, and all seven uh, cables were working. So yeah, that's that's one way to do it. I don't know if um, anyone's had any experience with anything else. That's what we did. Yeah, a, a similar one actually is is making sure that as the hydro or the person responsible for monitoring, you are very well aware of what drill and blast is going to be doing and what load and haul are doing so that you can get your logger before they drive over it or before they drill a pattern and blow it up. So ensuring that um, on a very regular basis, the teams operating in the pit know what infrastructure you have in the pit is the first port of call. If you can't put telemetry loggers in, which transmit your data at all times, and again, the values in the data, not in the logger. So telemetry really is your cheapest way of getting that information at all times so that if it does get lost, you've already got the data. You don't lose what was ever on the logger. But if you can't have telemetry, recover the logger first. That's absolutely the first thing you do because the data is on the logger. Get the logger out. You can always reuse the logger as well, but more importantly, you get the information that's on the logger. And then if the load and uh, uh, drill and blast or the load and haul teams know where your hole is, then it's quite often that you can uh, finesse the blast pattern to minimize blasting immediately adjacent to a hole or things like that. It, it takes a bit of discussion and not everybody's willing to do it, but provided you get the data of the logger, uh, that's your first, that's the most valuable part. Yeah, I think there's, you know, some operations who have a lot of input piezometers have a very good success rate mining through them. I mean, I, there's, there's several operations I know which will have a 80, 90 percent success rate in mining through VWPs. And they do it with various methods. They so now they've got to mine through them. They'll use uh, perhaps some some uh, thicker wall casing. They will adjust blasts around them. Um, they'll make sure the cables are colored um, and very visible uh, so so they know which sensors which. And so there's you know several several procedures that can be done to to give you good success rate in mining through them and you know again I've seen operators mine through VWPs for more than more than ten benches and the and the and the instrument still function fine. And we had a comment come in the chat about cost of recovery versus cost of VWPs. Can anyone comment on whether it's worth it cost-wise to recover VWPs? Yeah, it is because it gives you continuity of data. Uh, that's that's the main thing. As as, as Gus said, the, the, the value isn't the sense of the value is the data. And so if you can recover them, it gives you continuity of data in one location. So that's definitely worth recovering them. And I just want to take a moment to announce Simon Scholl has arrived. Hello, Simon. Welcome. Glad you made it. Hi, everyone. Yeah, sorry for being late. That's okay. We're going to make you answer all the questions now. Any other comments on uh, this question before we move on to talking about um, how do we distinguish quality of our VWP data? Going once? No, I think. All right. I think, you know, if anybody's got any specific questions, they can, they can let us know. I mean, we've got a um, few guys that I know are, I've done this lots and lots of times and I'm sure they'll be willing to answer questions. All right, so now speaking about um, low density data site, how do you distinguish quality of your VWP data? Um, or how do you identify if something has been poorly coupled or cemented during installation? Uh, okay, if I'll start it so again. So I guess the most obvious thing is if all the all the piezometers show similar heads, and if they all show similar responses, then you've got to question that. Now, just because they do that, it doesn't mean the data is necessarily wrong. Um, and you know, remember, from for many pits, there's uh, lots and lots of old geology exploration hole so if you just happen to have a piezometer close to an exploration hole that um that remains open then perhaps all the all the um sensors um will 
give similar responses. But if you know the exploration holes open, it's actually telling you something about the, the system in itself. Um, so I think that's the first thing is 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 look at the um, look at the um, the the the, um, the data set if everything's behaving similar similarly. Would that um, still go for a low data density site? Uh, yes, it would because I mean I'm assuming we're talking about um, multi level VWPs. So 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 yeah, um, if it's just a single VWP, then Again, if it responds to something, you've got to look, see what it responds to and see if its response is plausible to the surrounding stresses. Um, and so first thing is to look at the, the, the hydrographs, look at the responses and um, and um, and make a judgment. Uh, but then you know if it's if it's clearly if the if the sense is clearly not behaving itself, then um, Go go look at next thing to look at is the temperature data. Do the temperature data um, look plausible? And then go back and look at the installation uh, data. Was it was it calibrated? Was it um, was it uh, installed correctly? And um, I'll tell you now, Simon knows about, more about this than I do, so I'm going to put him on the spot. <laughs> Arrived just in time. I I was actually gonna gonna talk about installation. I mean. Yeah, it, it's not always easy to to distinguish whether you're getting real or fake data. Some things are very clearly wrong. Um, you know, incredibly high petrometric levels compared to any other groundwater level or ground surface elevation in the area. So there are some obvious ones sometimes, but it, it is very difficult. And really, I feel it does come down to the installation. I think too many people think installing VWPs are just a case of stick it in the hole and grout it up and that's it. But having good detailed records of your installations, um, making sure that you've got a pre-grout water level and um, a B reading or R reading, depending on what VWP you're using, um, be before you put any grout in the hole. So you, you know exactly what depth the VWPs at, and then you can track the grout as it comes up through the hole and understand the integrity of that installation. So don't rush VWP installations, don't rush the grouting. You know, try and try and cross-check all of the, the data as you come along because then even with the best installation in the world, you get some ambiguous looking data, and at least you can be confident in in the installation and so you know that that there has to be another cause for that ambiguous data it's not the installation itself so um yeah take take your time do the installation right and and, 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 and you know if you if you're not comfortable doing the installation we've had a, i've had a couple of holes recently that I've been involved with where we weren't very happy with the with the responses um on on the initial install so we you know we pull the instruments out and reset them um so again as simon says take your time and don't be afraid to do that just just a insert here for another live question that came in on um is there any specific grouting guidance for vwps you just talked a bit about grouting guidance um anything else on that topic that you would add other than take your time and well, there's a you know there's, there's there's several you know prescribed grout mixes which um, you know you can look at references to get, but it's normally a you know it's not you normally add bentonite to it, so the grout is softer and so it doesn't crack. So you're not looking at strength and the grout, so it's it, you you add the bentonite, so so it's softer and and a little bit more plastic and doesn't crack. So that's one thing. The the other thing is try and grout from the bottom up. Um, you know, if any, any any cementing in 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 drilling um, is best done from the bottom of the hole up, and and grouting is no exception. So um, so, so you you in place the grout in the bottom of the hole, pump it in, and the grout will rise up past the sensors. Um, having said that, you know there there are methods of doing it from the surface. Um, 
you, you know, our, our, our guys in Reno, for instance, have a have a system where they they install fiberglass rod, and some of that grouting is done from the surface, but they're pretty careful with it. Um, so yeah, so those are the that, that's 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 the one thing is 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 um make sure there's no bridges and the best way of doing that is is grout from the from the bottom bottom, bottom of the hole up and you might have to grate if it's a deep hole you might have to grate in several lifts so you don't exceed the um pressure rate on the sensors and use your vwps to your advantage they're there to measure pressure so look at the data as you're grouting you can see the pressure changing as grout comes across the sensor Grout obviously has a higher density, so you see a, a different pressure change. So, so use use that to your advantage to help you understand or try to interpret what's happening with the grouting as you go. Good. Yeah, my only comment to add on that is just notes. The best, better your notes are, the more easy it is for you to figure out what went wrong if you're questioning your your piezometer sets. Um, once you've got them up and running, the other thing I like to do is I'll also look at just the raw data as well, just to make sure that there's nothing funny with that. Because sometimes you can see um, some some errors or with the the piezometer by just looking at the raw data, um, and it's usually like either a frequency or the digits. Either one's fine. And then, as Jeff pointed out, temperatures also I find to be pretty useful, and if for some reason the markings on the top are not available, you can, we've had some success with just measuring the total length of the, the piezometer cable once it's in the ground using a TDR reader um, up to a certain depth. And I don't, I think it's like a thousand feet or about 300 meters or so. So there are those options. The other thing too is you you might have a bunch of piezometers stacking out hydrostatically at depth, and it might be that there's some sort of structural feature there, and as a result there could be some damage zone, and some connectivity amongst all the feet all the piezometers near that damage zone. So it, it might actually be what you're seeing. Jeff alluded to like additionally there could be old boreholes that were never really abandoned as well that could create that sort of hydro or that stacking out of pressures at a hydrostatic level. Thanks, Jim. I think um, your, your point about the, sorry, Joe. You, no, I said Simon, yeah. <laughs> the, yeah, your, your point about the raw data, Jim, is a good one, actually. I, some data loggers um, log both the raw data and an engineering unit that you have to put in the factors into the data logger, whereas some only output a single type of data. So if you've input some engineering factors to convert into meters of head or um, megapascals or something like that, there are sometimes errors in that as well. So I, I personally prefer a data logger that spits out raw data because then at least you've got the real stuff that the that the sensors are, are measuring. And then you can mess around with the factors to your heart's content in Excel or in a database system. But um, if, if you've got the data automatically converted to those engineering units in the data logger, it just adds another level of quality control that you, you're never 100% certain that the right factors have been used. All right, I'm going to pull up another just quick question since we're talking about installation. Um, and then I think we'll probably move on a little bit from piezometer installation since we have about 30 minutes left in the webinar. So that's just letting everyone know 30 minutes left. If you have questions, we have a lot open still, um, but you can feel free to keep adding those. We're pulling those from um, the live Q&A function in your Zoom panel. Um, so just any quick comments on drilling orientation for installing piezometers? How do you determine that? Are there any guidelines that you would put forth? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. I assume the question is kind of behind the wall um, from the crest or from a ramp. So the, the first thing to bear in mind is 45 degrees is the worst possible drilling angle, no matter the method you're doing, because it's the hardest 
for hole cleaning and evacuating chips. So if you want to angle your hole, either have less than 45 degrees from vertical or more than 45 degrees um, from vertical. And so the real guidance really is how, how steep is your pit slope. It, your, your hole doesn't need to be directly parallel to your pit slope, but as close as you can get it is better. You, you do have to take into account that if it's too close, you can risk drilling into your overbreak zone, and then you're actually not measuring the, um, the in situ formation. You're me measuring a modified formation that's been affected by mining. And so um, kind of keeping things parallel means you, you're probably going to be outside of that zone. Uh, and then starting as close to the crest as is safe and practical, assuming, of course, that the area is not unstable and there isn't a, a, a risk of the crest itself giving way. It's good. Anything okay. else from the panel? Um, it really depends on your target. Okay, and so uh, we've we've been saying that try to focus your um, piezometers uh, as close as possible to the predicted geotechnical deformation zone, and so a, a lot of times what we what we're doing now is we're putting in piezometers which are angled. 60 70 degrees behind the wall so we can see what's going on behind the wall so if we if we do those ahead of uh let's say an advancing pushback we can see what the pressures are going to be in the pushback we can see what controls we need in terms of depressurization as we mine the slope down we can see how the slope beha behaves to mining how the pressures behave to mining and how they behave to uh, the depressurization and they give us great data to which is directly applicable to the geotechnical model. So putting them in angle and in, in behind the wall is 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 something that a lot of people start to do. So a, another thing to think about is if you again, if you look around globally, a, a very large proportion of geotechnical instability in hard rock and, and also weak rock, but particularly in hard rock, occurs where you have structures that are parallel and sub-parallel to the slope. And so what happens is, as you mine the slope, if the structure is parallel to the slope, it can dilate, water can get in, and it can create a driving force. Whereas the, if the structure is in and out of the slope, it's not going to dilate, it's much less of a concern geotechnically. So given the fact that a lot of our geotechnical instability occurs where piezometers are sub-parallel to the slope, We've started to really push the idea of horizontal piezos uh, in conjunction with, as Jim says, TDRs. So we wouldn't do them horizontal. We do them probably seven degrees down because that's easier to install and it's um, yeah, it's easier to 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 make the installation and easier to drill. So if we you know, there's I can probably name half a dozen projects at the moment where we're doing this, where we have big instabilities close behind the wall related to sub-parallel structures. And we're putting in VWP, horizontal or seven degree down VWPs with TDRs. So we can measure the pressures at various distances behind the wall. We can see from the TDR where the shear is occurring in the piezometers in the, in the TDR because the TDR is also straight across um, the, the shear zone, which is uh, the best possible angle. And then we're using that information to constrain the depth of drilling with horizontal drain holes. So it's something we're really pushing is to is to really start thinking about putting in horizontal piezometers as you mine the slope down and use that to constrain your horizontal drilling program. Travis, I've just done a I've just done a paper on that actually yeah. on um uh, you know on on um. The, the the issues of trying to char characterize slope parallel structures. So if anybody wants to copy that, let me know. I'm sure we all do. Where do we get it? I'll send it to you. Okay. I can post it to the course site if anyone is in um a participant yeah, in the other course. I could do that. Yeah. Travis? Yeah. Jeff uh, stole my thunder, but there I was gonna bring up the horizontal um 
shallow piezos to measure uh, transient pore pressure, but it links to you know what Jim mentioned earlier about surface water. So what we've seen in some of our um, large open pits are these um, ideally in the pit, um, you know, sort of 20, 30 meters horizontally into into the high walls. But if you if you don't have access to um, or if you aren't able to either drill those um, those holes, I don't have time or or the real estate. Um, Shallow vertical holes uh, as close as possible to to the high wall crest um, are also um, you know effective and useful. Um, those are your early warning um, triggers for for any instability that might be um, might result as a you know, due to rainfall or poorly managed surface water or seepage from a waste rock dump. Um, those have also been good. So don't only focus on on the deeper stuff. Sometimes you know the stuff in the unsaturated zone is 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 also good, uh, especially on transient pore pressures. We've had one of our um, sites that had an excellent, you know, deep multi-level piezos parallel to to the high wall, but they were a little little too far away from from the edge of the pit, and uh, and they missed those transient changes. And, and I think Jim could also share a few good learnings on the, on that. Thanks, Travis. All right, I think we've done this question pretty good justice. Any other? Final comments for this before we move on. All right, and at this point, we have quite a number of open questions. So I'll invite the panel if there's any that you've seen come through that you would like to answer and have me pull. Um, please mark those. You can click on answer live and then I'll see that that's one that you'd like to answer live. In the meantime, I'm going to go to a pre-submitted question that came in through the course site, and it's related to confidence levels of your data, both pre-feasibility and feasibility. So the question reads from Jose, confidence levels of 25 to 35% have been defined for level two pre-feasibility and 15 to 25% in level three feasibility. Understanding that it refers to the confidence of the field data that is taken, but how are these confidence levels calculated? So understanding the confidence of the data for your feasibility studies. Can anyone comment on how that's determined, uh, how to interpret that, et cetera? So that's a good question. And the short answer is subjectively. Um, there's, there's, it's very difficult to, um, to put confidence in, um, in, in any hydrogeological system, particularly a pre-feasibility or, 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 or um, or earlier. So uh, I think the main thing is, uh, have you done um, pumping tests? And do you have you got drawdown? That's uh, one question, one, one, one thing for a to, to calculate the, the, the dewatering rate. And for pit slope pressures is have you got enough BWPs? And have you got responses in BWPs empirically from either test drilling or from, um, you know, from, from possibly from, from, from the pumping tests. So it's really to, it's re it's quite subjective. You can, you can do parametric analysis to, 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 to try and arrive at, at, at a, at a um, confidence level, but it's hugely subjective if you do that. Um, the parameters that you typically put in a groundwater model uh, are um, storage and permeability, and and as we've said earlier on, neither of those are particularly um, particularly strong controls on groundwater or pore pressure. Um, and so, in a, it really the confidence level really comes, I guess, from the geotechnical analysis. And again, uh, geotechnical analysis you um, is frequently uh, use. Um, Limit equilibrium or, or numerical methods to to calculate a factor of safety, but again, it's it's with parametric variations, and um, again, it's what controls the stability is typically not individual material strengths; it's the geology and the presence of structures. And you know, I always say that most instability occurs, or a lot of instability occurs, because the geology isn't quite what you think it is. And and how do you put a how do you put a um, confidence level on that? And, you know, you get, again, you've got, in terms of groundwater modeling, you can do sensitive analysis, you can do PEST, you can do all kinds of um, par parametric methods, but the, the, 
it's it's the geology that controls the um it control the, the that controls the sens sensitivity and geology isn't conducive to uh sensitivity or, or parametric analysis it's not conducive to to numerical assessment of of confidence or factors of safety so um it's um the, the answer to the question i think is 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 that it's subjective and often you can try and link it to your geotechnical um uh confidence level Any other thoughts from the panel? Jim? Yeah, if you don't yeah. mind me, Ed. Oh, sorry, Jim. Sorry. Go ahead, Rhett. Yes. Well, I just uh, I saw another question asking about the minimum number of drill holes for a feasibility study or a pre-feasibility study. And that is exactly the same thing. There is no minimum um, per se. And it depends really on what the rocks look like. Um, some sites you can get away with very few. Other sites need a lot. And that really becomes a judgment call um, based on the specialist who's looking at the stuff. Sorry to jump in ahead of you, Vijay. Oh, no, no worries. Yeah, I was just going to state that, I mean, the first thing I would do as I'm going through these studies is making sure that I can characterize each of the different rock units. What are the, what are the pore pressures in them? Um, are there structures that are cutting off the water or how are the structures affecting the water movement? So making sure you have the instrumentation, if you have big regional faults, make sure you have instruments on either side of the fault. Um, are there big changes in lithology? I kind of stated this earlier, but you just want to make sure you have the pore pressures in those areas. Um, and then, you know, are you, are your pore pressure monitoring at least deeper than what you anticipate your failure shapes or the depth of your failures? So you want to have poor pressures below where you think the failures might come through at a depth below that, but then also have them within those shapes, if at all possible. Um, you know, also, you know, if there's really different changes in rock mass characterizations, then maybe you want to make sure as you go up through the hierarchy into FS, make sure that you've got instrumentation in some of those zones where the rock mass is really poor just to make sure that you have the poor pressures in those areas um, and you know it's it comes down to a lot of subjectivity but hopefully that kind of gives you an idea of what you're looking for the other thing too is and it comes back to the data is make sure you have and you do analyses for um, transient. transient responses whether for us, our big transient response and impulse comes when we get our snow melt, where we're essentially adding 18 inches of water into our pit slopes in a month period of time. That's when we see most of the water infiltrating. So make sure you have that one to two years of data so you can actually start evaluating how the water is moving through your slopes. When is it arriving? How much is it changing the pore pressures within your slopes, because a lot of that can get used and turned into information like the RU factor, which gets used in a lot of our geotechnical modeling for areas that maybe we don't have a piezo in that area, but we have piezos in the similar rock types. And we can say, hey, the RU change due to our big recharge events are you know, 0 0.8 or 0 0.1, depending on rock mass type. So then you can put those in and help identify within the geotech models where you might have your slope sensitivities to water. So getting your instrumentation in early and then start doing that evaluation um, once you have that data. And you'll, that also points to needing to have weather stations and knowing when the precipitation's coming in and how much rainfall you're getting um, and then doing the analysis. So just making sure you have the staffing and then the people that are available to actually look in and do some of these inquiries into the data. Um, the data is, is like the first stop gap, right? But then you also need to utilize your data and come up with ways to help it or help you understand your system. Um, so you can, make the next leap and, and help out with understanding how your, the pit's going to be affected by recharge or precipitation events. 
Yeah, and and you know, I, I can't remember whether whether it was in the water book or the course, but I think I said that for a feasibility study for dewatering, you should try and achieve in your uh, pumping trials. You should try and achieve ten uh, percent of the drawdown you need. <clears throat> and if you do, <clears throat> excuse me, if you do pumping trials, you achieve ten percent of the drawdown you need for uh, operations. And you have enough piezometers that you can monitor it. And I think you, you know, you you are at a, a confidence level of, of you know, pro probably fifteen percent um, that you can your dewatering system will will behave as predicted. But it is all subjective, and geotechs will tell you otherwise. But the geotech analysis is always subjective because everything we do is controlled by geology, which doesn't lend itself to. Uh, numerical sensitivity analysis. Which will be the focus of a future webinar. We'll be talking about numerical analysis. Any other comments on this question here? I'm going to pull up a question that Gus marked, and I'll call on Gus to answer. Um, I am not familiar with the wire BMR tool from Orica, but I'm assuming Gus is because he marked this question. Um, <laughs> Gus, can you speak to this question, please? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm assuming by BMR tool, uh, you're referring to the borehole magnetic resonance tool that Orica are now selling. It's a outgrowth of a tool that was invented by Schlumberger in the early 2000s that was originally called the wireline NMR tool, standing for nuclear magnetic resonance. Uh, and what it does is it's a miniaturized magnetic resonance tool that uses radio frequency energy to induce a polarity flip in hydrogen atoms. So it's sold as measuring water because it's measuring the presence of hydrogen. Uh, one of the challenges, of course, is that clay mineralogy and hydrous mineralogy can have significant hydrogen in the crystal lattice um, itself. And so it really does require a very, very good understanding of the in situ mineralogy that's being measured. Um, so core logging is, is absolutely vital before the tool gets run. Or even if it isn't understood before it gets run, it's analyzed very closely in conjunction with the mineralogy and geochemistry of the hole uh, and the core that it's, that, that's been recovered from the same hole. The other thing to bear in mind is that the tool is only measuring one to four inches into the sidewall of the hole. And so it's really looking at a very small window uh, around the borehole itself. And so it's difficult to correlate across holes without sufficient density and without a good enough understanding of the broader geology and how um, information from adjacent holes relates to each other. So there can be a bit of a tendency to interpret spikes in adjacent holes as being directly related to water bearing structures or water itself. Um, and so it, it really needs to be analyzed very carefully um, and critically, I think, is probably the best way uh, to talk about that is, is don't just assume that it means there's water. Make sure you're looking at the tool, looking at the rock and, and getting a decent understanding of whether it's actually measuring pore water or the, the presence of pore water or if it's measuring miner mineralogy or hydrous mineralogy. Very good, good tips. Very important to understand what your data is telling you. Any other quick comments on this? I think Gus did that one pretty well uh, from his experience. All right, so I'm going to go ahead to another question here. Um, this also comes from a participant in the course. Um, could you comment on the geotechnical impacts that you would expect um, on the ramp or adjacent benches if you're using pre-advancement of the ramp as a pit floor dewatering option? Okay, that's actually a good question. So um, it, it's um, it's it's we we use it a lot for dewatering, but you do have to be concerned that you're putting an extra bench on the wall and you have to be cognizant of what that might do for the stability of the wall. Typically, it's only a small section of the wall. And so you would really look at where the ramp was coming down 
uh, you would make sure that there was no adverse structures and you would make sure you understood the behavior of the war, um, um, where you're going to uh, advance the ramp. So um, it's 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 really just comes down to, um, to, to, to trying to understand what the what the drop cut's going to get into is it any risk and then you and then you, you have to balance the advantage of pre dewatering with any risk of slope stability so it's like anything else we do nothing there's there's unintended consequences of virtually everything we do so you have to you have to you have to balance the um balance the consequences with the with the advantages Any other comments from the panel? Thank you, Jeff. All right. Uh, Travis, I'm going to pull up the question you marked. Um, and I think I, I'm guessing Jim will also have some input on this one, too. We have a lot of questions in here. I just need to find it. It was the, the one on how do you know if depressurization is uh, effective, I think. There it is. Yes. Yeah. I'm scanning through the PowerPoint. As as all the questions are coming in, my team is adding each question to the PowerPoint, and then I find it. <laughs> Here it is. OK. Um, okay. So Osvaldo, thank you for the question. Um, and I'll ask Travis to start with this one and then um, open to the panel. Noting that we have 10 minutes left in the webinar, um, I'll just mention to those who did not get their question answered today, um, as I mentioned, this is the first webinar of a series of webinars that are going to be happening on different topics related to water in mining. Um, so our next one's going to be focused on concept conceptual hydrogeological model. We're going to go into numerical modeling. We're going to go into dewatering, depressurization, all the topics, closure. Um, so check the GC's LinkedIn, join the mailing list, um, join the course, and uh, you can have access to this webinar. So we'll, we'll announce those and um, so for this question, I'll ask Travis to start. And um, Oswaldo asks, how do you assess that your depressurization program is having an effect on slope stability? In this panel, it was mentioned that you can put other types of instruments in the same boreholes, such as TDR or inclinometers. Is this the best way to get an idea of the effect of depressurization on the slope? So Travis, would you like to start, please? Sure. Uh, thanks, Osvaldo. And um, look, the, the this question is actually a little more complex than, than what it looks like, right? So um, how do you assess that your program or that your depressurization program is having an effect on slope stability? You, you first need to see whether you're having an effect at all on the pore pressure or phreatic surface, right? So your VWPs will give you that information. You'll see drawdown um, in, um, in pore pressure. Whether that then has an effect on slope stability, well, you'll then have to run your geotechnical tools. So things like your radars, your prisms, you'll need to see whether um, if you have movement, whether you have, have any uh, stabilization or settling, um, changes in its acceleration, et cetera. So yeah, it's not just the sort of the, the more hydro uh, geological specific instrumentation like your, your TDRs or your um, ESOs, VWPs, but couple that with, uh, with prisms and, and radars that will give you sort of a concrete answer on whether you, you're having an, a, a true effect. Um, you can, you do, and you, and you can get instances where you see a reduction in pore pressure, but you still have movement, right? So, um, or, or continued instability. That's, that's when you need to dig, dig a little deep and, and look at what's, what's actually driving that. Um, sometimes you might've reached, you know, gone beyond the point of return, right? Where we're reducing pore pressure now no longer has an effect and the slope is, um, is gonna go. Yeah, I think um, the bottom line is, can you relate um, the piezometer responses to either radar or prisms? And when you get to, I think, I can't remember, section four or module five, uh, there's some examples of, of depressurization, horizontal holes that have caused visible slowdowns on the radar and prisms. Um, you know, since we, since, uh, since we kind of did that module a couple of years ago, I mean, I think there's more and more data now. I'm seeing just lots and lots of data where we can link drilling of horizontal drains and pore pressures and um, and, and radar movement. And, you know, Jim, we talked with Jim earlier, about an hour ago, 
And uh, you know, he he's got some great examples of that at Bingham, where 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 he's linked um, subsurface deformation, surface movement on radars with piezometers and installation of drains and wells. So I think it's 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 getting that all, all the data integrated um, is 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 really something that's helping to to understand. Uh, the role of water in in stability, and 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 as 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 Jim and, and Travis have said, installing TDRs or inclinometers in the same hole as the piezometer or in holes close by will really give you uh, an an understanding of how um, bore pressure affects shear displacement, and 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 in in most settings you'll see movement subsurface in TDRs or inclinometers before you see it on surface on radars or prisms. Yeah, just to take it back kind of full circle too, just don't forget about the surface water influences. Um, we often are, all most of us are working in open pits. As a result, you are at, you know, you're, you're getting precipitation at various times of the year. And that could also mess with your signals of depressurization versus uh, movement rates a little bit. You might be depressurizing fine, but you also have to take into account how much water's come into the system as to, you know, are you being effective? It might be that you are being effective, but the additional water coming into the slope is replenishing, or replenishing uh, the pore pressures faster than maybe you're able to get it out. Because you might be pumping, while well, you might be pumping or drilled a horizontal drain hole into a segment of rock that is actively depressurizing. It might not be the main controlling structure or feature. And so you might see that, you know, rainfall and infiltration might result in a spiked increase in your depressurization or sorry, in the movement rates. And it might take a little while for that water to kind of migrate its way to where you're actually actively depressurizing the slope. So also look at the bigger picture as well, kind of my comment on that. Good. Thanks, Jim. All right. And as I mentioned, we will be getting um, further into these topics too in uh, future webinars. Just to note, our next upcoming webinar is going to be in about a month. On July 31st, we'll be um, at 3 p.m. Arizona time. We'll be talking about the conceptual hydrogeological model um, including topics such as porous medium versus fracture flow, the excavation damage zone, the conceptual model, water balance, water quality, and um, also some global benchmarking. So looking at specifics of different regions around the world. So make sure you uh, look at what Benjamin posted in order to find out how to register for that in the future. I'm going to pull up one final question that I think is going to do a great job of closing out the course um, came in anonymous, anonymously through the live chat. Um, but Jeff, you mentioned updating guidelines for characterization studies. Um, so I'll ask Jeff, as well as the rest of the panel, um, you know, this webinar was focused on site characterization and planning a mine hydrology program. So just to close out the webinar, um, what are some guidelines that you might use, some references that we can direct our participants towards um, just to close out? So Jeff, did you want to start? Well, I mean, really, the the the, the best references and the, the thing that most people use now are the are the are the large open pit books. Uh, there's there's five of them to date, uh, and so we'll link that in the chat. Yeah, and so they're probably the best um, reference guides. Um, which the water course is based on. Which the water course is based on, yeah. So um, the the the, the water book. I mean, most of it was written um, getting on for 15, 13, 14, 15 years ago now. So it it probably needs an update and it probably will get an update in a couple of years time. But the first of the guideline books to be updated will be uh, the slope design book guidelines for open pit slope design. And so there's a, there's an initiative now underway to uh, update that. And there's also going to be a course um, on the updated slope design book of which the, the hydrology is going to have a, a part of a module. Um, and so re really those are the 
those are the um the key guidelines. There's some good there's some good papers come out on horizontal drains uh recently and there's always good papers on slope depressurization. Um but really everything's condensed in those LOP guidelines. And I have linked that in the chat um, for those that are watching the recording. The, the website is um, lopproject.com, and they have a series of guidelines books. Um, the one that we are talking about is called Guidelines for Evaluating Water and Pit Slope Stability. Any other comments from Travis, Jim, Simon, Gus? All right. Well, let me just say a... Hearty thank you to all our panel today and all of our participants who joined us. Um, this was a really great session. We had a lot of questions that we were unfortunately unable to answer during the time period. I will welcome you to please reserve those questions and bring them to our next webinar um, where we will have many of the same faces in attendance um, in addition to other experts. Um, I see a lot of really nice reactions coming across the stream. Um, I'll also mention that the course that we that we were talking about, which um, some of the panelists here are presenters in, uh, that's based on the book Guidelines for Evaluating Water and Pit Slope Stability, is here. Um, it's been linked in the chat. And if you want more information on this course, which overviews all of the topics that you see there, um, you can go to the GC's website or just reach out to me um, or anyone at the GCE. So thank you so much for joining us today and we will see you at our next webinar. We really appreciate you panel. Um, great job today. Thank you. Yep. Thanks for everybody for attending. Uh, hope you got something out of it. Thanks everyone. Just... Yes. Thank you everyone. See you all. Bye.